as I've, I've told some of you, uh, this is not only my first time in Brazil, uh, not only my first time in South America, this is my first time in the Southern Hemisphere, and I cannot think of a better introduction to have. This has been fantastic. Um, I would, can, can, can we just have a big hand for the organizers, because this has been amazing. All right, so <clears throat> before I get into my talk, I want to straighten something out. Um, many of you probably know that, uh, that I produce a series of videos called Ruby Tapas. Uh, anybody subscribe? Thank you. Uh, I, this is what I do for a living now. This is, this is what uh, pays my bills. So thank you very much. Uh, what I did not know until recently, uh, until just a few minutes ago, as a matter of fact, somebody told me that in Brazil, Tapas means a slap to the face? <laughs> Is this true? <laughs> All right, so I just want to straighten something out. I did not know this when I named Ruby Tapas. In Spain, Ruby Tapas means small plates of food, I swear to you. So I promise if you subscribe to Ruby Tapas, I will not slap you. I can't make any promises if you don't subscribe. The world is changed. I feel it in the water. I feel it in the earth. I smell it in the air. The programming language landscape that we work in is changing. I've seen more viable new programming languages pop up recently than I've seen in maybe 15 years. And even some older languages have been getting new interest and new energy and new features. Chances are many of you are at least partially working with some of these languages. A lot of you. Now, PJ was just talking about uh, how Ruby's not dead. And, and Ruby's not dead, and I don't think Ruby's going to be dead for a long time. As a matter of fact, programming languages don't really die. But as much as I hate to say it, Ruby is not eternal. Like elves going into the West, Ruby will fade. Each of you will go on uh, to new communities, new programming language communities. Uh, new technology booms. I'm not sure, but I think it's possible that we may be, that I may be speaking to you now at, at the beginning of the end of the Ruby boom. You know, we have all these really neat new technologies that are coming along. So I think that maybe it's a good time to reflect a little bit on what we'll bring with us to these, to these new communities. When Historians of programming look back. What will they say was the legacy of Ruby? What will they say that the Ruby community brought to other languages and other communities? What should that legacy be? Well, I have a few, I have a few ideas about what I would hope that legacy would be. But to understand what the Ruby legacy should be, I think we first need to look at where Ruby comes from. And I think you're all probably familiar, or many of you are familiar with the, uh, the facts of the case. Uh, Ruby was invented by Mats in Japan in 1993, released in 1995. But I'm speaking more of the spiritual origins of Ruby. You may not realize this, but you are in the midst of a war. There is a battle going on waged for the hearts and minds of programmers. In the book Object Thinking, the author David West posits that there is a fundamental schism 
in the software engineering community. There are two schools. There is the formalist school on one side, and on the other, there's what he calls the hermeneutic school. For the rest of this talk, I'm going to use that interchangeably with, uh, with what I'll call the informal school, the informalists. Formalism is also known as or identified with rationalism or determinism, uh, mechanism. These are philosophies that go back to people like Descartes and Hobbes and Leibniz. David West says, central to this paradigm are notions of centralized control, hierarchy, predictability, and provability. Our industry has its roots in formalist philosophies. It has its roots in formalist disciplines. Mathematics, electrical engineering. And many of the practices that are promoted in software are promoted out of a desire to make ours a more deterministic and formal discipline. David West says, as a formalist, the computer scientist expects order and logic. The goodness of a program is directly proportional to the degree to which it can be formally described and formally manipulated. Proof of correctness for a piece of software is the ultimate objective. All that is bad in software arises from deviations from formal descriptions. Art has no place in a program. Art is nothing more than a formalism that has yet to be discovered and explicated. So what is the alternative to formalism? It's what West calls the hermeneutic perspective. Now, this is kind of a funny word. It may be it may be an unfamiliar word to you. Strictly speaking, hermeneutics is the study of the meanings of things, particularly the study of the meanings of texts. If you've ever hung out with theologians, you may have heard this word before, because theologians, are, are their job is, among other things, to take archaic texts in ancient languages and discover meaning in them for modern readers. But more broadly, hermeneutics can refer to a philosophical school, a school that believes that meaning is not an ob this objectively pre-existing platonic ideal that we discover. Meaning instead is something that humans create in the world. A hermeneuticist believes that there are no unambiguous meanings. Meaning depends on the people involved. It is something that is negotiated between writer and reader, between speaker and listener. It is that common ground that forms in their minds. So what is the, what is the, hermeneutic, the hermeneutic view of software development? The hermeneutic view says that the meaning of our software design is inextricably, inextricably linked to the people who worked on that design. This means that you can't take a UML diagram that was created by a bunch of architects and toss it over the wall to some coders and have them build exactly what the architects intended because the meaning of that diagram is tied up in the shared context and perspectives of the people who drew it. David West again. The hermeneutic conception of the natural world claims a fundamental non-determinism. Hermeneuticists assert that the world is more usefully thought of as self-organizing, adaptive, and evolutionary with emergent properties. Our understanding of the world, and hence the nature of systems we build to interact with the world, is characterized by multiple perspectives and constantly changing interpretation. Now we get to the, to the crux of the matter. The hermeneutic philosopher sees a world that is unpredictable, biological, and emergent, rather than mechanical and deterministic. Software development is neither a scientific nor an engineering task. It is an act of reality construction that is political 
and artistic. Let me repeat that. An act of reality construction that is political and artistic. There are some jarring concepts here. What does he mean by reality construction? Well, it turns out that a great deal of the reality that we live in from day to day is a mental construction. Now, this may sound like some sort of new age woo-woo mumbo-jumbo, but stick with me here. This stuff goes down to the most basic level. Fundamental things like the senses that we rely on every day. Take your vision, for instance. Right now, your eyes are constantly moving. They're making little darting motions, maybe between me and the screen, maybe down to your laptop or your phone. These, technically, these motions are called saccades. They're very, very fast. And you might expect, given that they're so fast, that every few moments you would be seeing motion blur because your eyes can't keep up. But you don't see motion blur. Why not? Well, it turns out the reason is, even though the data keeps streaming in from your optic nerve, your brain actually suppresses it. Starting just before the saccade, your brain turns off, it mutes that stream of data until the saccade is finished. Well, okay, so that's why you don't see motion blur, but if it's muting that input, you might expect that every few moments you'd be seeing flashes of black. But you don't see this either. Why not? Well, it turns out that not only is your brain suppressing input from your optic nerve during these saccades, it also edits out any evidence that it ever did any editing in the first place. It covers its own tracks. Effectively, what it does is it takes a snapshot from before or after the saccade and just fills in the missing space with that snapshot. If you've ever looked at a clock and it seemed like the first tick of the clock was slower than the ticks that came after, that's evidence of your brain's reality editing. And I bring this up just to demonstrate to you that even our most fundamental senses, the ones that we rely on the most, seeing is believing, right? These most fundamental senses are not as objective as we like to think. And it just goes downhill from there. Let's jump up to a much, much higher level of abstraction. Think of a friend of yours. Now, think about the friendship between you and that friend. Where can I find that friendship? What color is it? How many centimeters long is it? You can't point me to your friendship because it is not a thing that exists in objective reality. As the Buddhists would say, it is empty of independent existence. It is very real, don't get me wrong. Your friendship is very real. But it is a shared construction of reality between you and your friend and the people who know you. And these shared constructions of reality, they permeate the fabric of our lives. They are everywhere. Here's a very popular one. Money. Money has no independent existence. The, reason, the only reason money has value is because we all agree that it has value. It is a shared construction of reality. And many of the realities, the quote realities, that we model in software are the same way, particularly uh, if, if you're making software that is the, you know, the kind of software we do a lot in Ruby, uh, like e-commerce software, enterprise software, social software. A lot of these realities that we deal with, these things that we model in our code, are social constructions. Money, we already talked about. Departments in a company. You know, I move from this department to another department. That's not something that 
exists in any kind of objective reality. We, we model it in our systems. We have a field in the database somewhere. We have attributes in a model. But we're modeling something that is just something we agree on. The best person is, was in that department. Now they're in this department. What's a, de a department? It's a, real, it's a construction. If you look at the Earth from space, it doesn't have political boundaries inscribed on it. But we have fields in our databases for what country somebody's from. This is, you know, these, po these political boundaries are another shared construction of reality. I want you to join me uh, for a moment <clears throat> in a little conspiracy theory. Imagine, if you will, that secret societies are in control of the world. And in order to maintain their control, they arrange that all school children from a young age will be brainwashed in the classroom. They'll be brainwashed so that they're, they're hypnotized to be unable to see one particular word. When they look at this word, their, their conscious mind will just edit it out. It's like a, like a saccade for one word. And the word that they, that they hypnotize you to edit out is this one. All right, just kidding. It's Fnord. At least that's what I'm telling you it is. And they, they hypnotize everybody from a young age not to be able to consciously see this word, but when they're exposed to it, they're conditioned to start to feel uneasy, anxious, unable to think rationally, unable to make good decisions. All right? And then these secret societies, they arrange so that media reports will be liberally sprinkled with this word. And this is how they keep the population docile and easily controlled, by keeping them in fear all the time. This universe that I just described to you um, was created by a guy named Robert Anton Wilson, who wrote a book called the Illuminatus Trilogy. Now, this is a work of fiction, obviously, probably. But I find that it's, it's a useful way of thinking about the way that these shared constructions of reality that we live in, that make up the fabric of the world we live in are below the level of consciousness a lot of the time. We don't even think about them. We don't notice them. We just take them for granted. In this story, there are occasionally people who sort of wake up and are able to see the Fenords. If you've ever been outside of the societal mainstream in some respect, you have probably had the experience of seeing the Fenords. In my case, my first e experience of seeing the Fenords was in the context of education. This is John Taylor Gatto. In 1991, after almost 30 years as a school teacher, he was awarded uh, or he was, he was selected as New York State Teacher of the Year. That same year, he quit. And he wrote an article called The Seven Lessons School Teacher about the lessons that all school teachers teach to their students, whether they want to or not, whether they know it or not, lessons that go much deeper than any academics. Lessons like class position. I teach that you must stay in class where you belong. Lessons like indifference. When the bell rings, I insist that they stop whatever it is that we've been working on and proceed quickly to the next workstation. They must turn on and off like a light switch. The lesson of the bells is that no work is worth finishing, so why care too deeply about anything? Lessons like provisional self-esteem. I teach that your self-respect should depend on expert opinion. A monthly report, impressive in its precision, is sent into students' homes to signal approval or to mark exactly, down to a single percentage point, how dissatisfied with their children parents should be. 
And these are lessons that are absorbed regardless of what the academic subject is, whether it's math or science or history. These go deep because they're, they're part of the assumed fabric of just the way things work. They, they become part of the unquestioned fabric of reality for, for people who spend years and years and years learning these, these lessons. They become simply the way things work. If you, have you ever, when you were a kid, did you ever have adults tell you, this is just the way the world works? Clearly, John Taylor Gatto woke up one morning and he saw the Fenords. Now, I never had any trouble seeing these particular Fenords. Why? Because I was homeschooled. And as a matter of fact, for much of my childhood, I was effectively unschooled, which means that I, that I, directed, I autonomous, autonomously directed my own education. So I was observing people who went through these lessons year after year from the outside. I was an outsider. Um, and I was observing my friends going through this. And I, was, I could observe them absorbing these lessons. Um, but it was interesting because very often, if I talked to them about it, they would get upset. It, they, these, these lessons became not just part of their reality, not just the way things work, but almost tied up in their self-image. These are Fenords that I saw, but there were many that I didn't see. It's only been the last few years that I've realized that my experience of coming up in the tech industry is not everyone's experience. It's, it's very, it was very different from the experience, uh, particularly of many women and minorities in the tech industry. You know, I assumed that these institutions like open source were just obviously egalitarian and, and open and welcoming and meritocratic, whatever that means. Um, and, and I've had to learn after listening to many, many stories I've, had to, I've come to accept that what I thought was objectively true about these communities, about these institutions, was really just my subjective experience. There is no doubt in my mind that there are many, many Fenords that I am still blind to to this day. So reality is socially constructed. But what does this have to do with software? I learned object-oriented programming from the formalist school of engineering. There is a good chance that you did too. How do you know? How would you know? How do you tell that you learned OO from a formalist? Well, here's a good test. Did you learn about inheritance before you learned about polymorphism? There are a number of people. If you did, you learned from a formalist. This is Alan Kay. He's widely, uh, he's generally considered to have invented object-oriented programming, and he created the Smalltalk programming language. Uh, when somebody asked him about his inspiration for object-oriented programming and for the Smalltalk language, he said, I thought of objects being like biological cells and or individual computers on a network, only able to communicate with messages. I decided to leave out inheritance as a built-in feature until I understood it better. The guy who came up with object-oriented programming did not see it as something that was essential to include in Smalltalk, the language that was supposed to embody object-oriented programming. He didn't see it as something to, that was essential to include in it from the beginning. But the formalist school emphasizes inheritance. And this is because formalism is greatly concerned with ontology. It is greatly concerned with fitting things into neat, comprehensive hierarchies, where everything has its place and everything is in its place. And this goes all the way back to the Enlightenment philosophers. They were very big on ontologies. The formalist approach to OO goes something like this. First, discover the single, objective, unambiguous model of the problem. Then capture it in a hierarchy of classes. Then uh, coding the implementation is a trivial exercise. Uh, when I, in my first programming job, 
It was, uh, I was working for a big defense contractor, and uh, UML and case tools were all the rage, things like rational rows. And I remember being told that very soon we would just draw a class diagram in rational rows, and it would generate all the code for us. And this was the golden ideal of the formalist school. Here's a typical class diagram. We've got a slot on top for the name of the class. Then we've got a section for attributes, and we've got a full name attribute in there, a, re a readable full name attribute. Then we've got a section for operations at the bottom. What does it mean in Ruby for a class to have an attribute called full name? Does it mean that it will have a full name instance variable for the lifetime of the object? Well, this is kind of problematic in Ruby, isn't it? Because in Ruby, instance variables don't necessarily live for the full lifetime of an object. They spring into existence the first time they're needed, the first time they're assigned to. And as a matter of fact, we can even remove them before the object goes away. Does this class qualify as having a full name attribute? It's got a writer for a full name, but then it could be in, 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 initialized without a full name instance variable. And then the first time that full name is accessed, that instance variable will spring into existence. Does this, does this qualify? How about this one? Here there is no instance variable. Full name is constructed from two other attributes. Does that qualify as having a full name attribute? Or do we now have to move it down into the operations section? What about this one? Here there's no definition of a method at all. It's because full name is, is delegated to another collaborator object. Does that qualify as having a full name attribute? I don't think there's any good an answer to any of these questions because there is no sensible mapping between UML class diagrams and the way Ruby classes work. UML is in many ways a formalist inspired design tool. And formalists like to structure classes around the data in a system. And I think that this is because data in a way feels more objectively real than objects characterized solely by their behavior. David West has this to say about, about data driven uh, programming. Data-driven methods do not bring about the object paradigm shift. Instead, they carry forward a legacy abstraction, data, and use it as the basis for decomposing the world. It isn't consistent with decomposition of the world in a natural way because the world isn't composed of computationally efficient data structures. Data-driven methods tend to create objects with more frequent and tighter coupling than other methods. This reminds you of any popular web frameworks that encourage you to structure your system around the data? By the way, in case you're wondering what Alan Kay, the creator of object-oriented programming, had to say about data, this is what he had to say. Compare that class diagram to a design tool from the hermeneutic school, the informalist school of software development. This is a CRC card. Who knows what a CRC card is? So a CRC card is a very informal method. Usually you use an actual index card, a physical index card. You scribble on the top the name of an object. And on the left-hand side, you put a, le a list of responsibilities. And on the right-hand side, you put a list of collaborators. And you can see in this version, in this representation, full name has become just one of the behaviors, one of the responsibilities on the left-hand side of this, along with the ability to print itself to a label. It's not special. It's just another responsibility. It's a behavior. Because knowing something is a behavior. Knowing something is something that you do. And this representation of our class is consistent with all of the code that we just saw. Formalism encourages us to think like the machine. And unfortunately, it often distances us from the social effects of creating software. Klaus Peter Lohr has a, a story about this. He was teaching a class about algorithms and the limitations of algorithms. He says, in order to provoke a statement about the nature and limitations of algorithms, I asked the student, do you know an algorithm for consoling a crying child? 
To my dismay, the student began talking about actions like taking a tissue, wiping the child's cheeks, and so on. He had not grasped the essence of the question. So what does it mean to reject formalism in software? For that, we can turn to some of the exemplars of the informal school. People like Alan Kay, Rebecca Werfs Brock, Kent Beck, Sandy Metz. These are people that advocate a style of software development that's characterized by things like conversation, iteratively converging on a good enough solution, acknowledging multiple perspectives rather than a top-down view emergent, self-organizing behavior. These are people that advocate a view of, so of software that is as a fundamentally human and social endeavor. This is Rebecca Werfs Brock, one of the foundational object thinkers. She says, building an object-oriented or object application means inventing appropriate machinery. We represent real-world information, processes, interactions, relationships, even errors, by inventing objects that don't exist in the real world. We give life and intelligence to inanimate things. We take difficult to comprehend real world objects and split them into simpler, more manageable software ones. We invent new objects. Each has a specific role to play in the application. Our measure of success lies in how clearly we invent a software reality that satisfies our application's requirements and not in how closely it resembles the real world. We invent a software reality. It's not about finding that objectively true platonic model of the world. It is another venue for us to construct realities. Along with our team and our stakeholders, we try to arrive at a shared construction of reality that enables us to solve the problems in front of us. So we're constantly constructing reality, and we reflect our constructions of reality down into the software that we build, whether we're thinking about it or not, whether we realize it or not. But that's not where it stops, because software also reflects its realities back up into the lives of real people. This is Kristen Nygaard. He was one of the inventors of the Simula language. He writes this about watching Simula go into production use back in 1965. It was evident that simula-based analyses were going to have a strong influence on the working conditions of the employees. Job content, work intensity, and rhythm. Social cooperation patterns were typical examples. The impacts clearly tended to be negative. The impacts clearly tended to be negative. This is one of the guys who invented the language talking about its effect on the real world. Speaking of negative impacts, Facebook recently got into some trouble for performing experiments on its users. They wanted to find out if, if they could affect people's moods based on the content of their timelines, if they could make people happier or more depressed, just based on hiding th certain things or showing certain things on their timelines. And yeah, of course, it worked. You can do this. Uh, you can measurably change people's mood um, by changing what they see on their Facebook timeline. And a lot of people got up in arms about this. But the only thing shocking about this should be that anybody thought that this is different from what Facebook does each and every day. We are faced with a fire hose of information in this modern world. More and more and more. And so we erect filters in front of the fire hose to manage it, to cope with it. Facebook is one of those filters. If, we, if Facebook didn't filter the influx, then we would all switch to a social network that did because there's just too much. We can't cope. Unfortunately, the problem here is that there is no such thing as a neutral algorithm when it comes to filtering what people see. Every decision has consequences for a user's mood and worldview. Just how subtle can these effects be? Here's an experiment you could do. Take a volunteer. Sit them down in front of a computer. Tell them to take a survey. Then when the survey is done, have them get up and move on to another room. On the way to the other room, they encounter another person going the other way. That other person 
accidentally trips and falls and spills a whole cup full of pencils all over the floor. Observe your volunteer. Do they stop? Do they help out? Do they pick up pencils? How long do they spend picking up pencils? Now take another volunteer. Do the same thing. Sit them down in front of a computer to take a survey. Only this time, somewhere in the background of the room, put a subtle suggestion of money. Maybe one of the, the monitors in the background of the room has a screensaver with dollar signs on it. And then go through the same thing. Have them finish the survey. Get up. They go out into the hall to another room. They encounter the other, the other person who is actually an actor. Pencils are spilled on the floor. Observe what they do. Do they stop? Do they pick up pencils? How long do they spend? Do this over and over until you have a statistically significant data set, and then take a look at the results. What do you think you'll see? Well, this is an experiment that scientists have actually performed. And what they found is that the subjects who were exposed to the suggestion of money in their environment spent less time helping pick up the pencils. And this is a result that has been duplicated many times in many similar experiments. It's been confirmed many times. And the, the, the result, the conclusion, is that people with money on their minds, even unconsciously, act more selfishly, more self-absorbed. And there, this is part of a whole family of, of effects like this. For instance, people that have been unconsciously primed with words relating to death, like grave, are more likely to agree with conservative political ads than people who weren't primed the same way. People who are primed with words relating to old age, like gray or wrinkle, actually walk more slowly when they get up and move on to another room. This has been measured. They walk more slowly. With these effects in mind, look back at the timeline filtering and the targeted ads that Facebook and Twitter do and tell me that they are not modifying your reality each and every day. By the way, if you're interested in, in more about, uh, about these kinds of subtle effects, check out this book. It's amazing. You ever use some software that was obviously written by an angry programmer? How did it make you feel? Who did you yell at afterwards? Somewhere out there, your production code is affecting somebody's mental health. What effect do you think it's having? Recently, Microsoft announced a, a new technology they call HoloLens. It's an augmented reality system that promises to overlay a software world on top of the, the physical world. Now, do I think that Microsoft is going to succeed with this technology? No, because Microsoft is where good research goes to die. But I think somebody is going to succeed with it. I think it's pretty safe to say that something like this is going to become part of our day-to-day -day life pretty soon. I think it's safe to say that by the time my children are all grown up, every waking hour of their lives will be mediated in some way by software. Software is already mediating our day-to-day -day reality it, in the form of Facebook, in the form of Twitter, in the form of everything that runs on our phones. And this will only increase as time goes by. Software will go from being a form of reality construction to being the premier form of reality construction. So, reality is socially constructed. And we reflect our constructions of reality into the software that we write, whether we are aware of that or not. And then that software reflects its realities back up into the lives of real people. What does this mean? It means we cannot pretend that our philosophy as programmers is disconnected from the impact that our software has on the world. When we write code, we shape the world. And for decades, the dominant philosophy in software engineering has been a formalist, 
command and control one, a hubristic paradigm that says that we can know objective reality and model it in software. So what does this have to do with us? What does this have to do with the legacy of the Ruby community? Well, I believe that Ruby, along with JavaScript, is the heir to the form informalist, the hermeneutic philosophical lineage. In a way, it's almost an end run around the formalist school, because after decades of formalist dominance in software engineering, this language came along with its small talk slash lisp soul, but cloaked in a benign C-ish, Java-ish syntax that people could get behind and understand. Ruby is a very informal language. The language itself is very informal. Many of the things that are rules in other languages are just guidelines in Ruby. Many things have more than one way to do them. Ruby doesn't try to tell you how to do things. Constants are just really suggestions. Core classes are kind of really just suggestions too. And the Ruby community, maybe more than any other community, is steeped in informalist pr practices, agile practices. Agile, the agile movement, at least the original agile movement, is very much an informalist, a hermeneutic movement. We value conversation and consensus over top-down architecture. As a community, we value community. That's why we're here. That's why there are so many Ruby conferences. In a programming world that pays lip service to OO ideas while still teaching formalist methods, Ruby is a stubborn island of informalism. When I listen to how our industry talks about itself, I hear a cult forming. It is a cult of passion, a cult of disruption. The gospel of this ideology goes something like this. You are a hacker, which means that you are very special. Because you are a maker. No, no, you are a world changer. Join us. Throw your passion into the code, and you will help us to build the next big thing. You will change the world. Well, I believe this. After all, when we write code, we shape the world. But I don't think there's any reason to assume that the world that we shape will be a better one. I don't believe that this is something to get excited about. I don't think it's something to get all fired up about at some corporate sponsored hackathon. In fact, I hope you are terrified. I hope that you are humbled by this realization. Because this is an enormous responsibility. And efforts to shape reality based on formalist, mechanistic, oversimplified models have a history of unintended consequences. And as engineers, we love our simplified models. I do believe there's an opportunity here. I believe that there is a potential here to help construct a reality that is affirming and welcoming, a reality that respects human dignity and maxi maximizes choice, a more humane reality. But this is a very challenging task. It's challenging because it's not a matter of picking the right tools or using the right process or using the right patterns. If we accept that we reflect our values down into the code, whether we want to, whether we realize it or not, then to address this, we can't look into the monitor. We have to look into the mirror. If we can be mindful of the values that we reflect down into our code, if we can approach our craft with humility and an understanding of our limitations. If we can acknowledge that we always, 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 <clears throat> excuse me, always 
have a perspective. And it is only one of many perspectives. We are not gods looking down on the system. If we can embrace ambiguity, if we can view our designs as a conversation rather than a declaration, if we can bring these very human values to our code, then I think we stand a chance of bringing soul to software and of being the soul of our industry. And that is what I hope the legacy of the Ruby community will be. Thank you very much.